FM. So, first of all, thank you for joining us today, Georgina. That's right, thank you for inviting me. That's right. Um, we should explain how we know each other. Well, of course, boxer, athletes. Yeah, through boxer, yeah. So, um, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So, I'm Georgina Moore and I'm from Bristol uh, and I play boxer as a BC3 Grandpa and I also run my own boxer club, Jam Boxer Club, which I started in 2017. And um, if you wouldn't mind briefly explaining your disability. Yeah, sure. So my main disability is arthritis, which uh, means that I can't straighten my arms or legs and I've got weak muscles, but I've also got scoliosis of the spine and torticollis of the neck. So I'm a full-time wheelchair user and I need 24-hour care. And did you do any sports growing up? Um, not really, because unfortunately, when you're in a PE lesson growing up, they kind of take you out. Well, when I was younger, they took me out of the lessons and I was excluded from normal PE lessons and kind of had to sit in a room with a personal assistant just playing games. So I never really had the opportunities. Like, it's a lot better now, I'm sure, but I didn't really have the opportunities back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, you know. So unfortunately, I didn't really get into a lot of sport. My parents did actually get me horse riding at a young age, uh, riding for the disabled, but I, I didn't carry that on because it's quite a physical sport. And I did swimming, but that wasn't competitively, so that was it, really. And um, growing up, um, the condition must have worsened over time as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. As you get older, the fatigue and the pain definitely hits more. Yeah, but the only reason why I say that is because that you went to university and you were a, in a past life a primary school teacher. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, so first of all, I went to university and I did a BA in marketing. I got 2-1. Um, and then from that, I wanted to work in advertising. But unfortunately, most advertising jobs, you, most of my friends all went to London, which wasn't possible for me. So I ended up not being able to get a job. So the other passion I always had was wanting to be a teacher, but I was told I wouldn't physically be able to do it. But I'm a determined person, so I did my PGCE at uni and I qualified as an early years primary school teacher. And um, did you um, uh, did you get a job as a early PG uh, or was that not an option? Well, I tried to, and a lot of the um, a lot of my friends and colleagues they kind of start off doing supply teacher, which kind of gets you into a school. So then you can go on to be a teacher. But unfortunately, I faced a lot of discrimination. Even when I was training, schools would say to me, well, we don't know how you're going to manage. And then once I'd finished my work placement, they thought I was brilliant. You know, I was constantly having to prove myself. And supply agencies didn't like it because I needed to know the day before where I needed to go because I needed to know if it was accessible. I needed to arrange care to be able to come with me. So agencies didn't like that. So they never gave me any work. So unfortunately, I didn't get anywhere with it. And then you went up to um, fashion and textiles. How did that come about? Yeah, so obviously after the teaching wasn't successful, I'm not somebody that likes to sit around doing nothing. So I thought I'm quite a crafty person. I'm creative. So I thought maybe I could go on and do a textiles MA and then I could use that to start up my own business. But unfortunately, when I was doing my MA, I only got through the first year because then my disability really started to get more worse, like more like worse because of like the fatigue. And I was getting a lot of pain sort of doing a lot of design work where you're looking down all the time. It was a lot of pain in my back and neck. So unfortunately, I had to quit that after a year. So uh, presumably, presumably the master's was a two year course for you. Yeah, Sorry, it was two years. Yeah. Yeah. Part time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you got into boxer at the very young age of 33 years old. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a few years ago, 
so um, how did you get involved with that? Yeah, obviously, once I realised that, you know, my disability was sort of progressing and, and I was having more side effects, I went to a lot of pain management clinics and doctors to see what I could do. And they strongly advise just to keep moving as much as you can, because that's better for the body and the mind. So obviously, I thought I'm not going to be able to work, you know, that's out of the question, but I need something where I could be motivated and try and keep active. So my mum used to be a teaching assistant and she did botcher at school with, the, with dis, you know, disabled kids. So she said to me, look, you know, why don't you just go along and have a go? You know, you might really enjoy it. So I found my local club, but unfortunately it was still half an hour from where I live. So I'd have to travel half an hour there. Then the session was only an hour and then I'd travel half an hour back. So it was quite, you know, it didn't seem worth it to me. But that's where I got my first taste. That's where I threw my first botch. Because I used to be a thrower. I started off as a thrower. And that's where I threw my first botch ball as a BC4 athlete. <laughs> and that, that year, you started up gem Butcher as well. Yeah, so after, not long, after a few months, I thought, this is just silly. I need to find somewhere more local to me that does butcher. I mean, there was just nothing around my area. So me being me, I thought, right, I'm going to just set up my own club because it'll just be far easier than I can play and I can bring butcher to my community because I'm sure there was a demand for it. And yeah, the first session that I did, it was, you know, we had at least 12 people there. You know, there's definitely a demand for it. And since then, it's just grown and grown. It certainly has over the last few years. Um, um, you then got progressed onto what <laughs> was at that time, but to England academies, you were part of the gladiators, part of the academies. Yeah, after a year of uh, playing butcher, I was um, already in the academy in um, the gladiators in Gloucester. Um, and that was really good because it was, you know, a lot of learning from each other because we were all sort of elite athletes and we were serious about the sport. So it was really good to mix with all different athletes from different classifications and also having the coaches there. And, you know, that I really enjoyed and it was social as well. I, I really enjoyed the academies. Yeah, the academies were, was a great source of talent. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it was. Um, and um, moving on, so uh, when you first started, presumably you went on to the Heat Coat Cup originally. Yes, yeah, because it's really hard to remember now. But yes, yeah, so the first competition I did was a, as a thrower, BC4, Heat Coat Cup. And then I, that, I ended up in the BE Cup finals through that. Um, but the thing is with the BC4 category is there is a huge variation in ability. So I was told I was at the very low end of BC4. I was literally yeah. on the borderline. So I could throw a ball, but it was incredibly hard for me to throw. Whereas you get some at the other end that can power that ball to the back of the court. So I was always up against it. And my coach always said to me, are you sure you don't want to use a ramp? But I was just so determined to keep active and felt like I was really working for it by throwing the ball. And it took me a long time to accept that I just can't keep throwing. Yeah, and you carried on with that throwing um, until lockdown, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I did stuff, you know, inside my house through lockdown, you know, because they did the virtual stuff. So I was still throwing through lockdown, yeah. Yeah, you were, right. and um, I remember you putting up a lot of Facebook stuff, you know, going all cl exercises and all of the, you know, kind of um, keeping active, and you did a lot of sport England challenges, and you yeah. did your own challenge at one point as well. Yeah, so um, as part of my running my club, we did weekly, we started off doing weekly challenges um, via a video, you know, to do it virtually. Um, doing different challenges with balls and all sorts of you know objects in the house which I know then a lot of other people picked up on and started doing their own videos uh, but I also did the challenge for Botcher England to raise money where I had to throw I can't even remember how many balls it was now but it was literally for hours and hours I had to throw a certain number of balls for a certain distance to raise money for Botcher England 26 2.6 something like that well, yeah, it was it was a lot. It was like a marathon, I think. So yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, because at the time they were thinking of running. But of course, it had to be changed for yeah. COVID. Um, and then before COVID, you got the BBC Sports and Sun Hero Award. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, so I got the BBC Sports Personality of the Year Unsung Hero for the West, um, which was a huge surprise. I remember the BBC contacting me, asking if they could come and do some filming because I'd been nominated. So they came and did some filming at my house and sort of things that I did in life. And then they came to my botcher club. And when I was at my botcher club, they got us all together in a group and they ended up presenting me with the award saying I'd actually won the region for the award. So I was like gobsmacked. And then I got to go to the national award ceremony in Aberdeen, which was just unbelievably like, like it was just such a surreal experience. It was amazing. And that was for the, the, the club. Yeah. Oh, was the, the award was for the yeah. club. Yeah, because obviously it's Unsung Hero and because I had volunteered to run that club in my community, as well as having to deal with a disability and, you know, my own personal botcher career, I was nominated by Access Sport, which was really nice. In incredible experience. And uh, so during COVID, you went back to your presumably textile sort of life and you did quite a lot of... Um, Doing like, you know, old bits of bottles and uh, coffee, you know, uh, stuff. And they did a few umbrella, um, no, not umbrella, it was rainbow um, sewing and stuff. Yeah, because you bought one, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. did money for the NHS. I was crocheting um, rainbows and managed to raise a lot of money for the NHS, which was nice of people, yeah. Yeah, and they did some of your own touch scores and then people kept, kept asking you if it they can do some for you, you know, that sort of thing, you know, because you're doing a load of like stuff in your kitchen, changing things around. Yeah, because I, I, I really like, you know, organising things and uh, redecorating and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of like labelling. i got a special machine where I can cut card and label. So I'm doing a lot of card craft and labelling and things that I can do at my own pace. I do take a lot longer than the average person, but you know, at least it's worth it when you've done it yourself. Yeah, and you're very, very talented at that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, so was it, I'm, I'm assuming this was just after the first lockdown, um, that you went on to work with Rick, Ash, with Rick Ashley. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that was from the um, Unsung Hero Awards. Um, all of our, the regional winners from my year we had one guy who won one of his regions and he was really into music and he was like, came up with this idea about we could like do a charity single together, all of us. And I don't know how he managed to do it, but he had connections with the BBC. They got um, Rick Astley involved and he agreed to do a song with us on it. And we got to go and film a music video with him in um, the Olympic Park in London. Um, yeah, that was in September 2020, I think. And um, it was just a mate, like to be a part of something like that. And on the video, there's shots of me there and it says botcher and I've got botcher ball in my hand. Like, it's just another way to promote the sport. And that got shown on programmes like The One Show, you know, and all these other big primetime time. TV shows and it was to raise money for children in need. It was just apps. I just, I'm so lucky, honestly. I'm so grateful. And um, that's not your only claim to fame. I hear that your local BBC breakfast or whatever it was keep asking to do interviews. Yeah, uh, local uh, BBC mostly. They're just, whenever there's any disability issue in the news, they want me to give my side, you know, which is, you know, I'm not someone who's craving fame. I think some people think that I really want to be famous or something, but I don't. But I'm a real activist and I really want to fight for disability rights. And I think people like myself should be on TV more because, you know, they should see people like us on TV explaining what we have to go through and the rights are right. So I do it for that reason. I just think there should be more representation out there. 
So I'm often doing local and once it was on the national BBC breakfast as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you're doing very well with all that sort of stuff. And um, you, as you mentioned previously before, you were a PC4 when you first started. Yeah. And um, uh, presumably your condition got a lot worse and then now you're a vampire? Yeah, so unfortunately I had major issues with my back uh, when I was throwing. It it wasn't good for my back. And the spinal surgeon said to me that if you're leaning forward, because I had to lean right forwards in my yeah. chair to be able to get any power on the ball. He said, that's not good for anybody's spine. So I had to stop that. I was told if you don't stop, it's not going to get any better. So it was at that point I had to make the very difficult decision to stop throwing and use a ramp but of course it's a totally different game totally different <laughs> very different because then uh, for the viewers that may not know what to is because i've mentioned it a few times already yeah, <laughs> but you know so throwing and ramp is very different because with okay yes being a ramp might mean that you might be more um direct to the ball uh, but like, throwing but with a ramp you've got to do a stick or something to move the ball down the ramp and everything and then you've got to move the ramp and everything else so it's completely different and how do you feel now you've got news to the ramp how do you feel yeah I mean now obviously I think it's great because all those things that I knew in my head I wanted to do when I was throwing I physically couldn't do it but now I know what I want to do tactically and I've got the tools to be able to do it. So that is the big difference for me. Um, but yeah, it's just very technical because you've got all these numbers on, going down the ramp and you've got to explain to your assistant what number to put the ball at, depending on how far you want the ball to go. Um, and all, each ball, as you know, behaves very differently. So it is very tactical. And unfortunately, it's very expensive because the ramp alone is two and a half thousand pounds. And I was very lucky to find funding for that because I just could not have afforded to buy that. And you mentioned funding. Uh, you got a funding awards, didn't you, from different... Yeah. So there was uh, several funding awards that I got for the ramp, but now as I'm going through the part Botcher England pathway I've just been awarding the sports aid back in the best so they give you a nice pot of funding so that I can afford to travel to competitions stay away for competitions I still haven't even got the right balls for ramping I'm still using my old throwing balls which you shouldn't do as a ramper because they've been thrown so much they're all dented and they don't go straight when you're ramping but I've been doing that for the past year so I'm hopefully going to be able to buy a whole set of ramping balls as well now. So that is the one of the most key things with Botcher. If you want to get to a high level, you need that funding because it's so expensive. Yeah, and not to mention the stamped, the licensed balls that have come out they as well. They changed that, yeah. That's another thing. I mean, I know that's only international, which I've got a long way off, but yeah, they, they, constantly, they just change it, don't they, all the time? Yep, they certainly do that. Um, and you mentioned that you're on the pathway of what's doing and um, have you, have you, you haven't been on that for very long, have you? Uh, no, I've only been on it a year. So last year I was invited to join the England Future Squad. So they wanted to wait before I was officially classified as a BC3, which happened almost a year ago. So I was then allowed to go and join the England Future Squad which is obviously exciting because you're one below the England squad. But um, it's just it, it's really good because you go away to these camps, which is a bit like the academy. Um, you go away to the camps for the weekend. And like I said, with the academy, you're with all your peers that are all elite and very knowledgeable. Those that are, you know, been doing it a lot longer than I have. It's really good to learn from them. And I find that one of the most important things with Botcha is learning from other people. Definitely, and you know, and just um, and how are you progressing through the futures group? Yeah, well, I haven't obviously. It's only been a year, but we did a pathway competition where all the BC threes in the pathway in the England and England futures we all played each other, and I actually came fourth, which was a huge achievement considering I'd only been rampant at that point for a few months. So yeah. 
I seem to be doing okay. <laughs> yeah, you seem to be doing well. And how many BCFs were there in that competition? Uh, I think there was seven or eight, I think. Oh, all right, so halfway, that's not bad. For your yeah, no, no, it's not bad. And obviously, the ones above me are all the top, you know, England. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all the top ones, yeah. Yeah. And um, you're, you run for the AK for a little bit. Um, because, now, since you got reclassified, did you have to start back at Cricket Cup or were you okay for BE? Well, it was ultimate ultimately my choice but obviously I was advised by my coach to maybe go back because the thing that she was worried about is if I go straight in at the BE Cup and I don't do as well as I would want to do I'd be disheartened whereas if I start at the Heathcote Cup and um, like I won the regionals gold so that's already a boost you know for my motivation and confidence so she just advised to start there and learn and progress that way rather than trying to jump straight in. Yeah that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you were doing quite well anyway. So Yeah, I'm into the finals, which is uh end of April. So uh yeah, we'll see how I get on because that'll be obviously all the top B C threes from the Heathcote Cup together. So yeah. Yeah, and then with all the England futures and all that, you can then sort of go up to the B cap and sort of start completing or or we have a top B C threes in that group. Yeah. Exactly. I think, you know, I used to just want to be straight at the top really quick. You know, I'm very impatient, but I've learned it's not good to be that impatient because you're always going to be disappointed if you're like that. You need to have your own like little goals rather than comparing yourself to other people and just worrying what other people think about you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so do you now see Butcher as a long term career goal for you now well I'm 40 this year (laughs) or not I know I feel really old um well in botch I feel old um I do have to admit I do feel there is a level of age discrimination with elite sport I really do feel there is um they'll deny it till they're blue in the face but there clearly is a lot more um passion for the youngsters which I get but I just think sometimes they should be more open-minded when you see some of these uh, Paralympians that are a lot older than you'd expect and they go on and they're successful. So that does annoy me and that does get me down a bit, but I will keep going as much as I'm physically able to keep going. Yeah, and there's and there's quite a few um, older, should I say? Yeah. Um, on the pathway, you know, Caroline Robinson, for example. Yeah. 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 yeah there is quite a few of us, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, so you know, we'll we'll keep fighting for the oldies. Um, <laughs> give up. You know, if you've got the talent and you know you've got the passion, I don't see what else matters. No. no. And uh, do you do you see, do you see yourself going up to the Bot UK? Obviously, that's my dream because obviously yeah. I want to reach the Paralympics. That's everyone's dream, isn't it, really? But um, that that will be my end game. But whether I get there, we don't know. But that will be my goal, my long term goal. Yeah, for sure. And and then we'll be waiting. We've uh, we'll waited for that sort of thing. Um. So um, what do you see the future is for Botcher in terms of in general, and then for the BC freeze? Well, it's definitely a growing sport. I think uh, in the last few years, it has definitely reached a wider audience. I think that it's getting more exposure, which is obviously brilliant for the sport, especially when like the Paralympics put it on mainstream TV. I think that's so important and we need to see more of that. And I think it needs to be more integrated. In This is a huge thing for me because I was a teacher. It needs to be integrated more in education and schools, which I would love to have the energy to go into primary schools and get them to get it on that curriculum. Um, I think that would be a huge thing. So I definitely think it's growing and it's reaching a wider audience and we just all need to keep pushing it because without us, people like you, me, bringing it to the media, that's the only way it's gonna happen. And I think particularly with the BC3 ramping, I mean, because now in the Paralympics, you have to have females and males. I think it opens up a huge amount of doors, especially for females like me, 
because we are the minority by far. And I think they need to, you know, seriously push for more females in the sport. Yeah, and yeah, we should just uh, clarify that most disabilities in most sport are male dominated. Uh-huh, so yeah. yeah, so there's less females in uh, uh, in the disability belt, but there are quite a few uh, females coming through the, uh, every sport now, and we see a few of them in the media and on telly and in the Paralympics. Like that's a growth for that, and for the England, but UK to start getting that female quota they put in last year or two years ago to bring more females into the sport it's been really good and of course um last month two or three new females has come in to the world uh world program pathway program or something yeah it's growing over time and of course the media side of things trying to fall you know we saw david smith's uh Winning, winning gold last year on Ali at nine o'clock in the morning. Exactly, yeah. It's all growing. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, you need that exposure to make people aware of it. Because still, I say to people, I play botcher, and they'll say, "What's that?" And that you know, I'm still getting that now. Um, so we definitely need to educate more and more and more. We certainly do. And um, that's everything. Um, is there anything else that? You want to say that I might have missed out here? Uh, I don't think so. You've done great research about my life, so well done. But all I would say to anybody out there is if there's a sport that you, you know, you want to do a sport and you don't think you can, definitely give Botcher a go because it is fully inclusive. I promise you, we allow anybody to my club, whether you're disabled or not disabled. So please just have a go. And to plug in your club here, so if people are interested, how can they sort of contact you or see your box of pages and stuff? Yeah, so we're obviously based in South Gloucestershire, which is just outside of Bristol, um, and we run every Tuesday evening, 4 till 6, and you can find out more by following us on Facebook or Twitter at Gem Botcher Club, or you can drop an email at gembotcherclub at gmail.com. And if they wanted to get involved in Butcher in a more general sense, that would obviously be under Butcher England. So, of course, it's the Butcher England website. And yeah, you can find your local club. Yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll just sort of plug yourself in there a bit there, and try and get a bit more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, with your gym club, sorry, I've just forgotten something. So, the gym club, you've got about 15 members coming regularly now, haven't you? Yeah, about that, yeah, 16, but yeah, yeah. So we've got, basically we run, so half of the club are serious botcher players. They do the league matches. Um, So me and uh, our coach, Tom, who's also my carer, we do, you, we help those sort of train. And then on the other half of the courts, we've got those that just want the more social aspect of botcher. So luckily I've got some volunteers like my dad, who then helps them to play games more fun games and we're on my side we're uh very strict so yeah <laughs> very yeah you, you mentioned you're doing some league stuff with the club so presumably that's the national league that you're involved in yeah so the national league you start off with the regions so there is our my club has two teams and then there's another club that's got two teams so unfortunately there are only four teams in our region um, so we will play each other twice, home and away. So we're arranging all those at the moment. Unfortunately, I don't play in that because it's impossible for me to coach and play. Um, I'd rather give all my members the opportunity to play. So I sacrifice myself for that. But that's fine because it's more important. They love it. They just get, you know, so excited about the league matches and meeting other people from other teams. And last year they got to the finals, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, they got to meet you and your team. So they really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that because obviously you weren't there. No, I couldn't go because I was at the camp and then I couldn't get a hotel for the second night, yeah. No, so yeah, um, yeah. So when did you when did you, Jane Butcher start joining the uh, league side of things? When did they first do it? Oh gosh, well, <laughs> quite a few years ago because it was before COVID we first did it. That was our first year, um, and there were more teams 
them because Paul's Place were doing it, but they're not doing it this year. No. Yeah. So, and then um, is for the league side of things, are you hoping to go up to the Super League at some point, get promoted at some point, or is it just for fun and just sort of... Yeah. Yeah, I always say to them, honestly, it doesn't matter. Just enjoy it, you know, and they're really good if they don't win. They take it so well. And they, like I said, they just really enjoy the experience. And, you know, being there at the finals was just a huge thing for them. So I don't like to put a lot of pressure on my lot. Um, I want them to enjoy it, ultimately. Incredible. Yeah. And... Um... It's not just water based people you've got you've got autistic people as well or yeah well, we actually have quite a lot of learning disabilities um they really enjoy that um and we do have a few wheelchair users and then we just have a few with like cerebral palsy but they can walk so we have such a big range of abilities and ages you know we've got kids at school and then we've got adults that come along and everybody just gets on they don't see any barriers or anything. It's just a level playing field and everybody's treated the same. Incredible. And there's something to be doing very well with that, especially starting it in the first year playing it as well. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? I can't believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. And well, but that's everything. So thank you very much for joining us today. Ah, oh, thank you so much. It's been lovely to talk to you. You too. Just stop recording. Voice FM.